Welcome to our presentation um, for our final project for ME 5600 Material Properties and Processes. Um, for our topic, we chose to take a literature review of additive manufacturing of polymers, and our group consists of Jose Corrado, Thomas Barfield, Andrew Dolanga, Sean Maywood, and myself, Stefan Pella. Um, we're going to start off with a brief introduction of the technical concepts that we analyzed and the objective for the research. So to begin, uh, some technical background on additive manufacturing. Um, additive manufacturing is considered the process of converting computer-aided design, uh, such as CAD, um, a, into a, a physical object. Um, it's done through uh, the deposition of material uh, layer by layer onto a build plate. Um, it's considered advantageous because of its low cost, minimal tooling, and diversity of compatible materials. Uh, when you look at additive manufacturing as a whole, uh, as we said, uh, there are many materials that can be used, but today we'll be focusing in on polymers. Uh, polymers are really important in the field of add additive manufacturing. Uh, they are the most widely used material class, um, and this is for good reason. They represent an inexpensive uh, and easy to print solution. Uh, and by the word inexpensive, it's uh, meant by both the machine or process used. Uh, these machines are generally cheaper. Um, to get started up with, as well as the materials themselves fed through the process. Uh, the uh, supplies are also cheaper as well. Um, they're also highly diverse and tunable uh, for final, final parts, anywhere from a stiff to a flexible material, weak or strong, uh, so on and so forth. The overall objective of papers in this report is to assess the current functionality of utilizing polymers in additive manufacturing. Uh, the papers also investigate the wide availability of polymer materials and their cost. Additive manufacturing is currently being utilized heavily for automotive, aerospace, and biomedical applications. The papers also address common types of polymers, material properties, and printing methods used in additive manufacturing, common printing uh, parameters, and their impact on final part quality along with any necessary post-processing methods are also assessed. From here we're moving on to a summary of technical papers. So as to what Andrew alluded uh, earlier, uh, there are quite a bit of selections of polymers uh, that can be used for additive manufacturing. Um, you can see here on the chart on the right, uh, the there's a large cloud uh, representative polymers by the red cloud. Uh, compare that to the metals, which are represented by the gray cloud. Um, they have the polymers have a very um, wide range of tensile strength, uh, ranging anywhere from 11 megapascals up to like one or two megapascals. So trying to find a polymer that suits your uh, application uh, is, is pretty easy. Um, however, metals are still preferred for high load applications and that's you know clear. Uh, they, metals are going to outperform polymers in, in high load scenarios. Uh, but polymers in and of themselves are cheap, versatile and highly available, uh, which makes them uh, wantable. Um, but Printing settings, which we're going to get to later, uh, do affect the performance of the material. Um, so, for example, here, like we have the Ultim here on the lower left, um, and you can see that the tensile strength uh, differs depending on how it was printed, uh, and we're, we're, we're going to get into that later. So, some common types of uh, uh, polymers uh, that can be found are ABS, PLA, and nylon derivatives. Um, you can see here the, the, the comparison between their true stress and true strain. Um, where PLA is a little bit stronger than um, ABS and, and the and the nylon, um, but it's also the least ductile. Um, they all are very affordable, often costing less than a dollar per kilogram. Uh, so it, it's it's very attractive to somebody who wants to do something that's uh, pretty quick and uh, mass producing as well. Um, so for the polymers, in terms of analysis of, of how they are more likely to fail, uh, the polymers can handle large recurrent strains, um, but the uh, main failure mode, as to Andrew alluded before, is, is the, the way that the parts are made is that they're doing layer by layer. So this basically introduces uh, miniature cracks, uh, as you would say. So like the, the, the main failure would be uh, focused on fatigue. Um, and the printing orientation greatly affects the material performance. You can see here by the lower left graph uh, where you see those uh, wishbones uh, that were used to test fatigue. They tested different uh, layer orientations, and they have found that when the material was uh, printed in a horizontal manner and induced into a fatigue testing, that it outperformed 
the same material that was printed in a vertical fashion. Um, and the fatigue failure almost always started at the uh, between layers. And the summary of these results uh, is represented here by the chart on the right, uh, where PLA that was printed in a horizontal manner outperformed uh, ABS that was printed in both horizontal and vertical. And you can see that also PLA, whenever it's printed in a vertical manner, it's it's more it it performs closer to that of ABS than when it's printed in a horizontal manner. Uh, there are some advanced materials of uh, polymers. Uh, there are um, there are functionals and, and smart types. So so what this means is that you can add that you can have additives into your polymers that make them a little bit more applicable to your to your situation. Uh, some polymers are equivalent to have shape memory alloys, uh, which makes them great for trying to um, introduce them into uh, an application where you need it to, you print them a certain way and then they will bounce back um, at a later time once they, they are uh, applied. Um, they can be very sensitive to light or temperature acidity, making them very usable in sensor type or uh, applications. Uh, and in a sense, they can be programmable to a specific shape. Um, <clears throat> there are various additive manufacturing methods used for printing polymers. Uh, material jetting is one in which a thin layer of liquid material droplets is jetted onto a build platform. After each subsequent pass, the sheet is cured and solidified with an ultraviolet light. This pro process works much like a typical 2D inkjet printer, uh, but on a 3D scale. Advantages to material jetting include the ability to print multi-material parts and the ability to incorporate complex color patterns. The process is best used for non-functional prototypes that require a high-quality smooth surface finish. Unfortunately, the parts produced from material jetting are photosensitive and have poor mechanical properties that generally degrade over time. Uh, this is why it's ideal for non-functional components. Binder jetting is an additive manufacturing process where a liquid binder is deposited onto a powder bed. The binder is bound to the powder at the desired cross-sectional area and the printing bed is then lowered and the process continues until the entirety of the part has been bound. Uh, the binder is then cured in a furnace with the excess material. Advantages to this method include the ability to print complex components without support structures. It's also re relatively low cost compared to other methods of additive manufacturing. However, the parts are generally less accurate and also require post-processing after furnace cure. Uh, this can vary based on the intended application. VAT photopolymerization, or VPP, uh, this process uses a vat of photosensitive liquid resin which is exposed to radiation or light in some way. The light hardens the resin layer by layer into a 3D component. There are two main methods of VPP implementation, uh, stereolithography, which uses ultraviolet lasers to cure the resin, or digital light processing, which uses a digital light processing projector to cure the resin. VPP produces parts with a high resolution and high quality surface finish. Unfortunately, it's more expensive than other additive manufacturing methods and the parts are brittle. The material selection is also slimmer because they must polymerize with light. Powder bed fusion utilizes layers to selectively fuse a thin layer of material powder. Powder is then redispersed evenly and another layer is fused. The process is continued to create a complete 3D model. Powder bed fusion can create complex components with high structural integrity. No support, structures, no support structures are necessary and any unused material can be reused. However, this process yields poor surface finish and tolerances, which means post-processing is almost always required. Uh, material extrusion is one of the most popular and recognized methods of additive manufacturing due to its simplicity and low cost for consumer application. This process involves the use of a material filament that's forced through a heated nozzle. The layer below is melted by application of a new layer forming a bond as it cools. This is then repeated until the full 3D part is created. It's a simple and reliable method that makes it extremely affordable for typical retail consumers. However, it's got many drawbacks including high porosity, poor surface finish, and low resolution. There's also a significant amount of control parameters that determine the final print quality. These need to be set properly depending on the material and model being printed. Sheet lamination is an additive manufacturing process where thin sheets of material are bonded, ultrasonic welded, or brazed to adhere to the previous layer. Each layer is then milled or laser cut to the predetermined cross-sectional area. 
This is a quick and low cost manufacturing method but requires milling or laser cutting each layer. The major drawback is that it's not highly accurate and material is often wasted. At this point, we now have a knowledge of what polymer materials are used in additive manufacturing and the processes that take them from a material to a final part. What we'll look at now is the effects of machine settings on the polymer properties of the final parts. First is infill, uh, infill versus tensile strength specifically. Infill density is the amount of volume within the outer walls of the part occupied by material. Uh, through experimentation, we found that a, uh, it has a direct relationship with tensile strength. In the test below, you'll see that there was an increase of up to 20.78 megapascals when density was varied. This is because as density increases, there are less voids in the part and loads can be dispersed over a larger surface area. Infill pattern is another part of infill. It's the geometric structure of the material deposited within the outer walls of the part. Part strength varies based on pattern utilized. However, it's not as significant as infill density. The maximum width of the range between patterns was found to be 2.2 megapascals in the same experiment when varied from line, rectilinear, and honeycomb patterns as seen in the image below. The second parameter under analysis is layer height. Layer height is the dimension associated with each individual layer of material deposited. It has a direct indirect relationship with yield strength. And in this experiment, we saw that it can yield a 57.6% increase in yield strength when varied by as little as 0.25 millimeters. You can see in the image below that the biggest part of layer height is the aesthetic or the visual difference, uh, the ability to see each individual layer line. However, as shown here, in terms of material properties, the yield strength is heavily affected. And as previously mentioned by Sean, um, the nozzle temperature uh, can affect the modulus of elasticity. It's one of the many parameters in material deposition specifically uh, that can be affected. Nozzle temperature is the temperature at which the hot end of the printer is set to transition the material from a solid to a liquid phase. It was found that uh, it has a direct relationship with the modulus of of elasticity. Uh, when varied by 30 degrees Celsius, a 30% increase in stiffness was achieved. This is because as you melt more material, there is a less porous final part, there's less micro cracks in the structure, uh, and therefore you do increase the stiffness. The post-processing of additively manufactured polymers is also important. The technique used depends on several different factors, including the specific polymer used, the additive process, as well as the desired function of the part. We can break down post-processing into two main categories, uh, primary and secondary. Prim primary post-processing generally refers to the mandatory steps that must be taken once the part's manufactured. This may include removal of support structure, powder, or resin that's left behind as a result of the manufacturing process. Secondary manufacturing involves additional steps taken to enhance the function of the part, such as improving the surface finish through smoothing or polishing, uh, filling gaps, or applying coatings that serve a particular purpose for the application of the part that will be used. Vapor smoothing is a post-processing step often used with uh, FDM parts made from ABS. These parts generally do not have acceptable surface quality for engineering applications without smoothing or polishing. A study was conducted at the Ming-Chi University of Technology in 2016 to explore a vapor bath process and the impact of surface roughness and dimensional accuracy of ABS parts. The parts with varying flat angles and curvatures were tested so that the impact could be observed across differing geometry. The top picture shows the opt optical results, and the bottom picture shows the measured surface roughness uh, from this experiment. Overall, it was found that the surface roughness could be reduced by approximately 98% and still maintain dimensional accuracy. And this method of polishing is cost effective and it has a high process stability. Uh, so that means that unlike uh, manual sanding, which relies on the skills of the operator, um, the settings uh, for a vapor bath process like this uh, are able to be controlled with controller and uh, get more consistent results. 
Polymer printed parts are commonly annealed to reduce the thermal stresses uh, inherent in additive manufacturing. Uh, the inner layer tensile strength depends on the fusion bonding. So the introduction of carbon fiber reinforcement, uh, although it's been found to improve the tensile strength in the material axis, the axis perpendicular uh, or the inner layer uh, axis is significantly weakened uh, through carbon fiber reinforcement. A study conducted at the University of Maine in 2019 further investigated the benefit of annealing uh, PETG and PLA polymers reinforced with carbon fiber in contrast to their non-reinforced counterparts. 105 samples were divided into five uh, or sets of five and uh, annealed at a temperature above the glass transition temperature uh, for varying durations. The PLA samples were also annealed at a temperature above the cold crystallization temperature. It was found that annealing the carbon fiber reinforced PETG and PLA polymers above the glass transition temperature regained the inner layer tensile strength of their non-reinforced counterparts. Uh, annealing above the cold crystallization temperature of the PLA polymers uh, was found to have no effect. We'll now move on to the overarching conclusions from the previous presentation. In terms of experiment validity, we found that all experiments utilized standard specimen geometries, such as rectangles and dog bones. They also follow tensile test standards. When, in, uh, when investigating the uh, data or the post-processing of data, uh, it was found that they utilized proper equations. After reviewing all of the experiments above, we learned several principles. First, in terms of material choice, we found that material properties are extremely varied amongst polymers. Generally, straight thermoplastics are inferior in strength, but similar or superior to metals in fatigue. More advanced materials and multi-material polymers offer advantages to strength and fatigue. And there is the possibility of using multi-material uh, functional polymers or polymers reinforced by other classes of materials that respond to the environment due to retained strains. Uh, in terms of uh, ability to tune processes, it was found that infill has a direct relationship with tensile strength. Layer height has an inverse relationship with yield strength and the nozzle temperature has a direct relationship with the modulus of elasticity. After printing your part, uh, post-processing is key and techniques used depend on material and additive manufacturing process utilized. Vapor smoothing can significantly reduce surface roughness and provide a better aesthetic in ABS parts. And annealing in carbon fiber reforced PETG and PLA can regain inner layer tensile strength. Looking at some future work, in terms of materials, uh, further research is needed into programmable and biocompatible polymers. There's also further research that's needed on specific material doping processes, which are used to make functional polymers, um, such as polymer transistors or flexible, well wearable um, microelectronic machines. Also, bioengineering research is continuing um, and looking to use shape memory polymers as replacements for body parts or as scaffolds for tissue-based 3D printing. And then the final frontier, or I should say the next frontier, is uh, nanoscale polymer printing. In terms of determining the correct parameters used to tune the processes, um, experiments should be run with fan speed, print speed, and wall thickness to better understand how to tune these material properties. And then finally, given all of those above, the material advancements, the improvements to print processes, and the introduction of new polymers, uh, further research needs to happen in post-processing techniques. And then finally, large-scale use of additive manufacturing requires the development of automated quality control and post-processing moving forward. So now thank you for your time and we would like to open up uh, the room for questioning.